Um, y'all bear with me because y'all know I, I got a whole, I had a whole list we were supposed to talk about the audacity of the rain, but listening to Roxy, um, and y'all know I don't play about when the Holy Spirit's able to move, I just be moving. So I don't have any notes. And I'm literally, I was like, wait a minute, Lord, what you say again? Because I, I ain't get that part of it. So y'all bear with me this morning. But as Roxy was talking um, today, the Lord was, was, was saying in my spirit, remind them, remind them, remind them. And so we're, we're not going to talk about the audacity. Although to believe this, you do need to have some audacity. I will finish that next week. I'm going to operate on what the Holy Spirit told me to teach this morning. So we're going to be um, in Genesis uh, chapter 35. And, and all of you guys know this story. And so this is why I believe the Holy Spirit was, was saying in my spirit, remind them, remind them, remind them. And also forgive my voice. I'm, I'm losing it. So um, just bear with me. I know I sound like Barry White this morning. Um, but uh, this is not a story that is unfamiliar to us. We know the story of Rachel. And I say this all the time. Rachel is my least favorite person in the Bible. I don't care how beautiful they say she were. She was. I don't care if she was. Uh, his heart's desire. Mm -mm. When you think about Leah and Rachel, you think about these two sisters. When you look at the heart of Rachel, it was just ugly. It was it was just ugly, and for a lot of different reasons, right? Um, but the main thing is that she was loved most by her father. She was loved loved most by her husband, and it with all that love, it never transcended to her heart. And kind of what Roxy was talking about this this idea that. There are people who love us. There are people we can we can have all the money in the world. We can have people who love and support us. But if it does not internalize itself, if we are not grounded in God's love, then we will make ugly decisions. We will do things that not only affect ourselves, but they affect generations to come. And I'm so glad that we have a God that is able to break generational curses, that has the ability to allow a generation to change the tide of those things that have been passed down to them. And so really quickly, and I do mean quickly because this is all the Holy Spirit is giving me. Um, we're gonna talk about the death of Rachel. And so if, if you know anything about this story, uh, when they were, you know, when, it, when Esau and Jacob were having their spats, the Bible says that, his mother sent him to live with her brother. And uh, once they got there, she, he saw Rachel, he loved her. And he was like, okay, what do I need to do? He said, well, you worked for me for seven years. And the Bible said he worked for seven years and then um, he tricked her and gave her a sister, right? And he was like, this ain't the one I wanted. But he was like, what do I need to do? And the Bible said he worked for another seven years. So basically 14 years and about, this, this is how much he loved her. The Bible said that, when he worked, it only seemed like a year to him. Like, it wasn't even a long period of time. I don't know about nobody else. I love Corey Duff, but if I had to work 14 years for him, y'all got to send me Morris, Co Co Boris Kojo, Morris Chip, somebody, baby, because, look, 14 years, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need more than your hand in marriage, okay? But the Bible says that he loved her so much without even knowing her intimately, just, just based on what she looked like. It didn't feel like a very long time for her. So here's this man who's willing to put 14 years of his life on hold because he loved us. Some of us have dated dudes that weren't willing to put 14 hours on the line, let alone 14 years, but he loved her that much, right? And, and so then she was loved by her father. So the Bible says that her father and her husband began to have a dispute, and so they needed to break up. And so the Bible says that she stole her father's idols. And so you can read this on your own time. I'm trying to give you the short version of this. So the Bible says that she stole them. Her husband didn't know. She just stole them. And then her father comes and hunts them down as they travel, right? And the Bible says that he confronts her husband and says, okay, who, you got my idols. He said, I don't have them. And he asked everybody if they have them. The Bible says she buried them. And he says, this is what her husband says. He says, may death, may the person who has it, made their death be excruciating. In other words, this person needs to die, whoever stole it. He did not know that his favorite bride had stole the idol because I believe that if he knew Rachel had stolen the idols, he wouldn't have said it. But he said it because he didn't want to be falsely accused. And so because she could not be honest and she had buried her idols, that, that, that inability to dig them up is the reason it caused her death. I thank you, Holy Spirit, because I wasn't even going to talk about this. But here's the thing, she stole her father's idols and she buried them. She took 
she knew God, right? She knew, because think about it. These people were descendants. They knew Christ. They knew God. They knew who he was. And yet her father, the house that she was raised in, they had idols outside of God, right? And so because she was living, leaving this environment that was not conducive to God, she needed to take something as a reminder, right? She took idols as a, a reminder. She took adultery as a reminder. She took fornication. She took gossip. She took whatever it is that you're idol is that you just cannot let go she took it with her. even though she was going to a new land that was blessed by God and she was being led by God she had to bring an idol with her right she had to take something from her father's environment if you know anything about her father he was a dishonest man they were not blessed the house the only reason they were even blessed is because her husband who was a man of God was there and so the man of God is leading her to a new place, leading her to a place where she can be redeemed and restored and be renewed. And yet she takes idols with her. And then when she takes the idols with her, thank you, Holy Spirit, as she's taking the idols with her, even when she is confronted by God, because her husband serves as a prototype to God, when she is confronted by God with an opportunity to, to confess her sins and give the idols up, the Bible says she, bear, she buries them and because she could not relinquish the idols, it caused her death. I need you to understand there are some things that you buried deep. You have some idols. And idols are not always worshiping celebrities. Because when we think about idols, we think, oh, you know, we're worshiping our cars. We worship money. No, 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 no. Idols can be your pain that you just will not let go. Idols can be uh, 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 idols can be those those things that have hurt you, the church hurt that you just will not let go, the divorce that you just will not let go, the rejection that you just will not let go. So even though God has blessed you with new relationships and a new place and a new job, you've taken idols from the old place, right? You've taken idols from your old experiences. You've taken idols from your old relationships. You've taken idols from these places that were not environments that you needed to be in because remember I said this last week we don't get to choose who what family we're born into we just exist we wake up and we in poverty we wake up and we in a rich family we wake up and there's child molested we as children we don't get to choose which family we are attached to now I love my family but if the Lord had given me a choice okay I would have been Oprah's child but I probably would not have known God right and so because I didn't get a choice God placed me with a mother and a father who already knew him Right. And because God knew what my gift was going to be, I needed it home in that poor household. I needed it home in poverty. I needed it home in, in Whitman, Alabama. That's a place where people say, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I'm a living witness that it can. And so I needed it home in that place and not with Oprah, because if I had been attached to money, if I had been attached, I don't think that I would have lived in this gift. It took poverty. It took my environment to make me conducive for my anointing. I'm getting off track. Let me get back. But here we are. God is giving you something new. Maybe you're in a new relationship. Maybe you have a brand new marriage. Maybe you have children. Maybe God has blessed you with the job that you want. And yet you're bringing idols from your old boss, from your first marriage, from how you were raised. And now you, you and God gives you an opportunity to confess that to tell him about it, to allow him to heal you, to own up to your part, because there's a part that we play sometime in our own suffering. And yet, instead of confessing and exposing and giving God the ability to heal, you buried it deeper. You pretend, you think you can sing it. You think you can out sing it. You think you can pray it away. You, you, think, you, can, you think you can teach it away. You think the louder you sing it, no ma'am, the hurt is still there. I don't care how many church songs you sing and how many solos you sing and how many lessons you teach, the hurt is still there. The pain is still there. You're still this far. You still got them same issues. And let me tell you how it rears his ugly head. Last week, and I said, shared this. This is why I know this ain't no Holy Spirit because I don't have none of this written down. So don't ask me for no notes because I ain't got it. Listen, I had lunch last week with our pastors, one of our pastors at our church, me and my husband. And we were, he, he's, well, how was marriage life? And if you know me, you know, I love being married. I love being up under my husband quite often. But I said, we, he, we were talking about the process and we went through therapy because we was about to break up. Okay, not not why married, but when we had our long engagement, because I know people are like, y'all been engaged so long. 
Y'all, y'all ain't gonna get married, baby. Ain't don't rush me. Okay, first of all, sisters, stop rushing these sisters going down the aisle. That's another story. Anyway, went to counseling, went to therapy, cause cause I just wasn't happy. I got this good man, I got a good job, and I still don't want to get married yet. I still want to kind of look and see what else is out here, cause you know Boris may may decide. Okay, no, for real. So he says we get in therapy, and Corey says something like, "No matter what I do, she seems very uptight." She's not relaxed in this relationship. And as I went through therapy, this is what I realized. When my, my dad died suddenly, okay? And, and, and y'all know I'm a daddy's girl. I felt abandoned. I didn't realize that I felt abandoned. Even though I still had my mama, I felt like the sudden death of my father, I felt very abandoned. And so I had this man who loved me, who cared for me, who raised me, who gave me God, did all these great things. And then I get a, a, a good man. And I was always holding my breath in my relationship, waiting on the shoe to drop. I just always felt like at some point Corey would abandon me. And because I felt like that, even when we got engaged, you know, most times we get engaged, like, oh, he minds. Now I didn't, I never relaxed. I never relaxed. But once I dealt, once, once I decked up that that idol of abandonment, right? I had to I had to own that. Somebody had to pull that out of me because I had buried it so deep and I couldn't understand why I just couldn't let my walls down. But when I pulled up that idol of abandonment, those of you who lost parents and you are still maybe young or maybe you were an adult, but you still need your mama, right? Right. I'm in my 20s. I still need mama. I'm in my 30s. I still need my daddy. There are times now I want to call him and be like, Dad, why is this man crazy? But but I can't, right? And so those of you who know loss know what I'm talking about when you feel abandoned. So when I exposed that idol to God of abandonment, he was able to heal some things in me. And so now in my marriage, I'm not treating my husband like he's going to abandon me, hiding money from him, hiding things from him because I'm preparing for him to leave, right? When you expose the idols, God can heal it, okay? So, okay, now let me get to my real part of my list and I'm done, because that wasn't it. So the Bible says, because she did not reveal her idols, her husband declared death on her, not, un- not unintentionally. So this is what happened. So she's pregnant, she, she's pregnant with Benjamin, because this is the part the Lord wants me to remind you of. So the Bible says she's pregnant with Benjamin. And so this is what happened. This is in 16 part B. It says that Rachel began to give birth and her label was difficult. During her difficult label, the midwife said to her, don't be afraid for you have another son. And with her last breath, for she was dying, she named him Ben Onai. Now, I need you to understand. I'm going to read the rest of it in just a second. I've taught this before, so I know some of y'all already know where I'm going with this, but I, the Holy Spirit said, remind you, so that's what I'm going to do. The word Ben and I means the son of my misery, the son of my pain. Those of you who are mothers, who have children, 99.5% of most mothers will give their left last breath for their child. I don't, my, my mother... There's a lot of things, but one thing she don't play about is her daughters. I'm trying, my mama, the nicest person you will ever meet. If you know her, you know her. But I'm telling you, you want to see her ride out, mess with one of them. My mama don't play. She, it, it ain't no playing over me and my sister. When you are a mother, the way mothers love their children is, so I always say, if you ever want to know what God loves look like, look at a good mama. It's as close as we're going to get in the flesh to what God loves looks like, that unconditional love. And so for a mother who knows her last breath, because I say this all the time, back in these days, names meant something. They weren't just naming a child, Venetia and Vakisha. And if your name is Vakisha, I ain't trying to talk about you, girl. Kudos to your name. But 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 they weren't naming a child, just random names, picture frame and apple and window seal. These folks were naming their, name, naming their children's name because they believed that the name would be a prediction of how they would live their lives. And so here she is a mother who knows she's leaving the earth and she curses her son because of her own 
pain because of the idols that she kept bearing and she would not reveal. She curses her own self on her way out the door. Most people, when we leave here, we want to make sure our children live a better life than us. We got insurance. We didn't got a life plan. We got things because we don't want we want them to have a better life if we're leaving here, right? That's what we get insurance for. We want our children to live better. We want them to be better Christians than us, right? And yet this mother because she didn't deal with her own idols and her own pain and everything else that she had going on with her. all these people who loved her. She was the, everybody's favorite. Like Roxy said, everybody loved her. Yet there was no love on the inside. And so with her last breath, she curses the only son. She says, you're not even going to be bitter now because you are the son of my misery. Can you imagine? And I know it's somebody on here. You ain't got to say that to me. I know this is some of y'all grew up with mothers that really didn't love y'all the way that you needed to be loved. Maybe your grandmama raised you and grandmama told you it was nothing. And grandma didn't love you the way that you need to be loved. There are some people like Sister Pointer who had a grandmama who I love Sister Pointer's story. If you ain't never heard, I feel sorry for you. But when she talked about her grandma, I could just do a backwards flip. Do you understand me? There are some of us who mothers couldn't love us. And so our aunts and our grandmothers raised us and maybe people in the community raised us, but somebody somewhere found a way to love us some type of way. And, and so when a mother who is supposed to be God's love exemplified curses her child with her last breath, what do you do with that? Right? And then the father, <laughs> the Bible says that with her last breath, she called him Ben and I, but his father called him Benjamin because his father serves as a prototype to God in this story. And so because the mother with her own pain could not love the child the way that he needed to be loved, even with her last breath, could not give him a name that would give him honor and that would give him something to hold on to in her absence. The Bible says the father steps in and calls him Benjamin, which means what? The son of my right hand. <laughs> I wish I could understand that God was stepping in this thing and say, hey, listen, I won't care where, I know you didn't get to choose your mother or your father or the environment that you were raised in. I know the man that you chose for you was not the right man for your life, that that marriage didn't work. I know the daddy ain't around. I know you feel ugly. I know you feel rejected. I know your job ain't what it used to be. I, you, 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 you know what? You done had a, you done had a raw deal. I understand that because I am God and I placed you in a thing, right? But God says, I don't care what they call you. I don't care if they call you a whore. I don't care if, they, if you used to be gay. I don't care if you used to be a thief or God, whatever you used to be. God says, I'm going to give you an opportunity today to change your name. And I'm going to call you Benjamin. See, I don't care what they call you. I want you to answer to Benjamin. Answer to Benjamin. Because now you have become the daughter of my right hand. Because see, the world can call you one thing. The world can, 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 can remind you of all your past hurts and pains. The world can say, you know what, bury it deep in whatever you don't even know. If it, if it ain't no face, it ain't no case. If, it, if, it, if it's out of sight, out of mind. But I'm gonna tell you as a child of God, out of sight and the mind don't work when it comes to idols. God says, dig it up, dig it up. I'm giving you a chance to confess it today. And, and, and when you do that, God says, and then I'll give you a new name. I'll go ahead and call you Benjamin, the son, the daughter of my right hand. I don't care what your mama called you. I don't care what the boss called you. I don't even care what your husband or your children. They may all be crazy. But God says today, if you just dig those idols up, you ain't got to die. You don't have to die. And, 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 and not only that, I'm going to give you a new name. I'm going to call you my child, my daughter of my right hand because you mean something to me. His, let me say this. Jacob may have loved Rachel, but he ain't love her enough to sacrifice his son. <laughs> he wasn't going to sacrifice his begotten son. God is not going to sacrifice his begotten daughter, which is you. He's not going to sacrifice you, no matter how much he may love something God has preserved this time and this space for you. I'm done, sisters. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Won't, won't the Holy Spirit